this is a horror film. Not the usual kind featuring haunted houses, creepy creatures, ghosts, or ghouls. The stars are people who could be your neighbors. Ordinary looking people conducting innocent looking business in a business-like way with the ordinary machines of modern technology. But what you see here should be more frightening than other horror films, because this is a true story. It's going on right now, and you are the target. Your rights as citizens and union members are supposed to be the victims of this crime. of lunatics. In fact, they're members of the United States Congress, the newest and most effective front men for the new right-wing movement. Now, it invents a multiplying number of front groups. Instead of gathering behind the banner of a candidate or an issue, it's in place, the ready reserve, ready to spring into action on an issue, support a candidate, even seek a candidate where there isn't one to suit them. It's invading public life at every level, working not only for candidates for president in the United States Congress, but for state legislatures and local offices. More and more, it relies on public officials as their front men, mouthpieces. More and more, it uses disguises and fraud. And behind it all is the sophisticated use of computer technology to raise more money and organize more people faster than ever. The goal is to strip the trade unions of the legislative and political strength they must have to protect their workers' jobs and all of the important aspects of their lives as American citizens. And this is how it works. A room like this one is the heart of the new right wing's political operations in this country. It's tidy and usually unattended. And it's double locked and electronically sealed. It houses an enormous computer system containing the names of about 10 million people who give willingly, generously, and automatically to their favorite right-wing causes and candidates and organizations when the right buttons are pushed. The list grows daily and so does the right-wing war chest, because these people are programmed to write a hefty check every time a vicious right-wing anti-union appeal lands in their mailboxes. There are two ways to get people excited enough to give their time and money to a cause. These are hope and fear. They plant and fertilize the fear with distortion and outright lies. But they've gotten smart. They clothe their misrepresentations in sober, respectable-looking, often official-looking wrappings. Well, look what happened, for example, to two well-established and respected United States senators, Frank Moss of Utah and Gail McGee of Wyoming. Each lost his seat as a result of a right-wing hatchet job featuring new and effective organization and wide distribution of an objective-looking article in a respectable-looking publication. In each case, the weapon used to accomplish character assassination was a collection of lies and gross exaggerations, and the innocent-looking, modestly-dressed publication was spawned by the ultra-right-wing John Birch Society. This fact was mentioned nowhere on its pages, of course. What happened to Moss and McGee happened in other races, and the same guns are loaded at the hearts of other candidates. The new right doesn't rest after election day. That same bogeyman, fear, works just as well to churn out the same weapons. Distortions and misrepresentations aimed directly at progressive legislation which might help working people 
poor people, old people, average people, just trying to make ends meet. Oh, they're out to get OSHA and kill workers' protection on the job. And they want to send public employees back to relying on favors and patronage and to prohibit them from organizing into unions. Oh, they're the J.P. Stevens of the political arena. No union representation in politics. Well, they do it with this. Tons of mail. These, then, are the weapons in the new rights arsenal. Dollar power. Something the right wing has always had in abundance, as well as some new powers. Technology power. Based on its sophisticated computer and direct mail operations. Manpower. For it has learned its lessons well from its labor and liberal adversaries on how to organize and mobilize mass campaign. And yes, brain power. In fact, especially brain power. The new right wing has grown tough, pragmatic, and systematic in devising its strategies. Like other kinds of assassination, character assassination requires the services of a skilled, experienced man. His name is Richard Vigory. Now, you've probably never heard of him, but he's the brains behind the new right wing, a founder of its most effective organizations and the principal link between them and others. In defeat or elect a man. And we're convinced... We're He's come to be known as the godfather of the new right. ...that will defeat. The secret of his power lies in his mailing lists, the very best in the country. Through his lists, he can reach, in a matter of days, an estimated 10 million true believers of the right Anyone who ever contributed to or worked for a right-wing candidate or cause is on his lists. He's created an empire by using them in an effort to destroy all the things we stand for. All forms of mass communication in the country, radio, television, newspapers, magazines, except one, direct mail. And oh, sure, the right-wingers get into other issues, but always, when they want to press the buttons, they come back to the anti-union theme. It's their bread and butter pitch. Now let's meet some of the supporting cast. Reed Larson, head of the National Right to Work for Less Committee, is a big time operator with a staff of 85, a budget of $5 million plus, and an enormous direct mail operation once aided by, you guessed it, Godfather Richard Vigory. The committee, which now handles its own mail operation, sent out 25 million pieces of mail in 1977 alone. Enough mail, in fact, to earn it its own private postal zip code. This is Joseph Coors, brewer and anti-union zealot. His politics are as bad as his dealings with his workers. He's trying to break his workers' union at his brewery and he's trying to bust all unions through his funding of the ultra-right Heritage Foundation. Here's a man who needs no introduction. A grade B actor turned grade B politician, Ronald Reagan. Although reminiscent of the shoot from the hip, rough-riding old right, he's become the single greatest hope of the new right. Now, one of the organizations they operate through, under, and in between the groups they have cleverly woven into their intricate web. Now, they're harder to watch because they overlap, interlock, coordinate, and multiply like rattlesnakes. Many exist only on paper, don't represent much of anybody. Some bear crude and hostile names such as Committee to Defeat the Union Bosses, and most hide behind innocent-sounding names such as National Action Committee. Many are spin-offs of Richard Vigory's operations and serve simply as fundraising vehicles, a means to sell another used concept to the gullible and the devout. They roll monotonously off Richard Vigory's political assembly line. Occasionally, the name of an old familiar enemy crops up, 
the National Right to Work Committee, for example, or the John Birch Society. Now, you may be asking, how do these groups present a threat? Their most effective device is the use of members of Congress as mouthpieces. Right-wing congressmen and senators sign right-wing fundraising letters, usually on their own congressional stationery. Way down at the bottom, it says, not printed at government expense. As for the senators and congressmen who sign these letters, almost all are officials or former officials, fundraisers and fund recipients of many ultra-right organizations. Senator Carl Curtis, Republican of Nebraska, Conservative Caucus, Young Americans for Freedom, Heritage Foundation, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress. Senator Jake Garn, Republican of Utah, National Right to Work Committee, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, Heritage Foundation. Senator Orrin Hatch, Republican of Utah. Americans Against Union Control of Government, National Right to Work Committee, Young Americans for Freedom Conservative Caucus, Fund for a Conservative Majority. Senator Jesse Helms, Republican of North Carolina. Americans Against Union Control of Government, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, National Right to Work Committee. Senator Strom Thurmond, Republican of South Carolina. Young Americans for Freedom, American Conservative Union. Congressman Lawrence McDonald, Democrat of Georgia. John Birch Society, Committee to Defeat the Union Bosses, Conservative Caucus, Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress, American Conservative Union. Congressman Philip Crane, Republican of Illinois. American Conservative Union, Heritage Foundation, Young Americans for Freedom. There are many others just like them from all sections of the country. If any of these so-called public servants represent you in Washington, you'd better watch what they're serving you. It could be poison. And then there's the special case of freshman Congressman Jack Cunningham, Republican of Washington, who won a special election recently in the state of Washington. It's a classic example of how a candidate is absorbed by and helped by the new right political organization and pays it back with interest. The National Conservative Political Action Committee, a Vigory Front, provided Cunningham with campaign management, media advice, mass direct mail fundraising, identification of voter support, and a get-out-the-vote program. Its fundraising provided a large share of the $429,000 Cunningham spent. But Cunningham wasted no time in showing his gratitude. As soon as he took office, he wrote a fundraising letter on his own congressional stationery for NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. And in it, he launched a vicious attack on the labor movement, declaring that the AFL-CIO support of an election day registration bill clearly meant that, quote, George Meany and the rest of the big union bosses are hell-bent on seizing total and final control of our entire election process. The new right wing has had phenomenal successes in recent years and is preparing itself for even greater successes in the near future. Richard Vigory says he expects to raise $35 million this year for over 100 congressional campaigns, for three to 5,000 state and local campaigns nationally, and a variety of other right-wing activities. When he says he intends to be in three to 5,000 races in 1978, that means his operation extends not only coast to coast, but from the highest to the lowest level of our government. Virginia is a good example of what he has in mind. As this Washington Star chart indicates, the state is well organized by the new right wing. It's fertile ground for Vigory's vicious campaigns. In the 1977 Virginia governor's race, 
Vigory engineered the defeat of a good friend of labor, Henry Howe. Vigory was responsible for a massive direct mail campaign for Howe's conservative opponent, John Dalton. There were four letters from Dalton and a vicious anti-Howe letter from Representative J. Kenneth Robinson of Virginia. There was some false statements in the letter. Robinson admitted later. Too much later, however, to lessen the damage. And no wonder Howe said the election was a victory for Vigory. In that same state at a lower level, Vigory was responsible for a fundraising appeal for a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. The appeal, signed by a United States representative from clear across the country, Robert Darnan of California, warned Virginia voters of the threat of big labor bosses. These are just two examples of what is planned for the future. To handle the load, Vigory will double his employee rolls to nearly 600. In the meantime, the 450 corporate political action committees, which contributed $5.8 million to 1976 political campaigns, will greatly expand their programs in 1978 and beyond. They'll easily triple their funding. They're not officially a part of the right-wing web, but most will support most of the same anti-union programs, candidates, and causes. The corporate PACs are a new force to be carefully watched and seriously reckoned with. Add Vigory's $35 million to some $18 to $20 million in corporate PAC money, and you've got a $50 million plus war chest to oppose our friends and support our enemies. A horror film is supposed to have a happy ending. After the monster has scared us out of our wits, we should enjoy watching its destruction and go home relieved and happy. The ending of this film has not been written, but together we can write it. Remember the weapons? Dollar power. They've always held the advantage here, but there are more of us than there are of them, and if we each give a little, we have enough to do the job. Technology power. Machines work for us, too, helping to organize campaigns, telephone banks, precinct work, direct mailings. Manpower and brain power. We've always had these in abundance, along with energy and determination. The weapons are the same, but the ammunition is very different. Instead of lies, we use truth. Instead of personal attacks, we use issues. Instead of hate, we use compassion. Instead of cowering in fear, we walk in hope. We now know what we are up against. An intricate web that has a way of clinging to the dark corners, of growing constantly to ensnare, entrap, and often to triumph. But we are stronger. We have the collective strength to act in our own best interests and destroy the monster ourselves. We are the principal target of the right-wing machine. But we can beat it. The film you've just seen demonstrates the serious threat to the labor movement and the candidates we endorse a threat posed by the radical right wing. The danger is even greater because you've seen only part of the story. Also growing larger and threatening labor endorsed candidates are the hundreds of corporate political committees. Together our enemies, new and old, plan an all out attack on the labor movement and its friends in 1978. For example, the National Association of Manufacturers recently set up a so-called Committee for Union-Free Environment. It is designed to help businesses get rid of existing unions and defeat workers' attempts to organize. Backing the NAM are several professional agitators who have learned there's money in union busting, slick lawyers and consultants who run schools on how to prevent union organization or how to dump the union in your plant. At the same time, the so-called National Right to Work Committee 
has announced 1978 legislative campaigns for a compulsory open shop law in New England and in Idaho, Missouri, New Mexico, Montana, and possibly Indiana and Colorado. This business front, with a war chest of $8 million, has vowed that if it is successful in 1978, it will fight for a national compulsory open shop law in 1979. Clearly, business and its conservative allies are out to bust unions wherever they can, in the plant or through legislation. So we have a big job to do in 1978. Whether we win or lose will be determined by our ability to provide the facts to our members, to make them aware of this threat to their paychecks, to their unions, to the very institution of trade unionism in America. We know that our opposition will have more money than we have. In fact, the radical right and corporate political committees will have millions of dollars in their political war chests. We can't match their dollars, but we can assure adequate funds for our political effort if every local union takes advantage of the new election law and seeks a contract clause providing a voluntary checkoff for political contributions. If every local union has a COPE committee, if every union member donates a couple of bucks to COPE, I know our members will respond if we give them the facts. They have responded before. In 1958, they repulsed open shop threats in major industrial states after we were able to give them the facts. In 1968, they cut the Wallace vote down to size after we were able to give them the facts. I'm confident they'll do it again in 1978 when we give them the facts. The election of 1978 is a testing ground, a test of democracy, a test of money versus people armed with the facts. We must make certain that informed votes count more than the hoarded gold of the far right. That is our job in 1978.